All right. So let it give our, our speakers getting a nice glass of water. So please give a slightly delayed but warm welcome uh, for our first talk of the day, where we'll be learning about uh, looking for malicious hardware implants. <sighs> Hello, good morning. I'm Falcon from Leviathan Security. Um, this, this talk is about basically uh, it's some, some work that I did shortly after this became a really big thing halfway through last year um, about how to, how to look for and find malicious hardware implants. So a malicious hardware implant, um, it, just to clarify and set definitions, is a device that's been added or some functionality that's been added to a piece of hardware that you have. Um, <clears throat> that is intended to steal valuable information from you or subvert the functionality of your system. Um, so I want to start by introducing some research that some other people have done. Um, this paper won Best Paper at Oakland several years ago. It's called A2 Analog Malicious Hardware Trojans. Um, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend that you do. Many free copies are available and simply Googling the title will yield it. Um, it's a wonderful paper because what they did is they came up with uh, a malicious hardware implant of their own in an open source x86 processor design. Um, so there's an open source x86 processor and you can simply, um, it, well not very simply, but you can download Download it, modify it, and build it. Um, fab your own x86 processors and do a lab. So what they did is they took it more or less stock and uh, they did this. Um, that may not be immediately meaningful or clear what exactly this is. Um, it's uh, this is the die. <clears throat> And what they did is, in the, in the tiny part of that die, and this diagram is just lifted from their paper, um, they actually blew it up and they added a couple of extra traces. And what that did is, uh, that small device on the bottom right, the A2 trigger, um, depicts, basically they, they added uh, a line and a capacitor and a gate. And what it does is it charges up and uh, it charges up based on the divide by zero line and leaks a little bit. So it charges up to gate potential if you thrash the divide by zero line a few hundred thousand times dividing by zero, it'll charge up, the gate will flip over, and oh, it flips uh, the, the RPL register into zero instead of one, and you're the kernel now. Uh, that's basically how x86 tracks, whether you're in kernel mode or whether you're in user mode is, uh, is two bits in a register, uh, the, the code segment register to be precise. And uh, this, based on the, the functionality that it wasn't one thing, it wasn't a payload, it has to be done iteratively, um, it, it exposes some functionality in the processor that shouldn't be there. Um, <clears throat> this is essentially a really good model for the way that, that a malicious hardware implant can work, and also kind of a worst case scenario for one. Um, it, it's very hard to detect by iterative functional testing. The device appears to do what it says it does until the time that it doesn't. Um, you have to know something about what the device is doing, so simply looking for signatures or trying to look for exfiltrated data uh, may not yield anything because the thing that's happening is beyond the domain of what you've expected. Um, so with that, um, I'll discuss my framework for how to detect these. Um, my framework focuses mostly on things where somebody added a single chip or similar to your device. Um, it's conceptually possible that it might also work for something a little bit more complex, uh, excuse me, a la this, um, but that, that's not, uh, not going to be as easy to do as, as I'll show in a moment here. Um, so my methodology for looking for malicious hardware implants um, mostly begins with sensitive signals. Um, I define a few sensitive signals here. Sensitive signals are anywhere where you have some kind of information flow that is valuable to you, some kind of, of permissions level or control check that you do in your device or your code. Um, code itself, of course, and uh, any side channels that might be available to your attacker. Um, so I'll give some examples of some of those sensitive signals quickly. Um, RAM lines are clearly a sensitive signal because they fall into multiple of these categories. They fall into both information flow, code, and sometimes even permission levels and, and side channels. Um, it, network interface lines, NIC lines is the same. Uh, the, the lines that are used to communicate over a bus to your network card uh, tend to contain data and uh, sometimes also unfortunately code. Um, <clears throat> Human interface device lines are the same way. This is your keyboard and mouse. Uh, it can be quite valuable, and uh, when Van Eck freaking was a thing, uh, that was definitely uh, 
that was definitely the target. Um, lines that go toward your TPM. So these, uh, if you're not familiar with the uh, trusted platform module, this is a device that um, it acts almost like an onboard smart card, but not really. It, it holds keys and allows you to do cryptographic operations on those keys. It also has some limited capacity to measure the system state. Um, I'll talk about implants that target those in a moment in general, not in specific, uh, for reasons. Um, it, data lines for spy flashes are also a sensitive signal because these are the lines that do things like they, they hold the code that runs your BIOS. Uh, so as your system boots, it reads the code for the BIOS off of this into memory and executes it. Uh, of course, this, this code is exceedingly valuable. Um, and finally, power management ICs. Uh, I threw this in there, but it's not an especially valuable target. Power management ICs tend to have a line on them that, uh, that declares whether or not power is good. Um, they also react to, to power demand changes uh, in current in the device, so they, they exhibit um, what would be called active regulation. Um, and they have a feedback loop, generally, which uh, changes in its electrical characteristics based on the actual demand of the gates and, and other components within your device. Um, so they're, they're a fairly good place to look at side channels, because often they're more isolated than the entire power supply. They'll be doing something like trying to condition the power for a particular submodule on a main board or something like this. Um, so as for how you deal with threats to these, well, RAM lines we can deal with um, with an academic developed technique called uh, oblivious RAM. Uh, one implementation of oblivious RAM, unless I'm absolutely butchering someone else's terms here, is um, you essentially have the CPU encrypt all of the things that go in RAM. And when the CPU reads them out of RAM, it has a decryption key in a register somewhere, and it decrypts them, uses them uh, when it wants to put them back in RAM, it encrypts them again with that key, and uh, they're encrypted in RAM. Uh, many implementations of this, some work better than others, but if your worry is that somebody might intercept signals that are uh, going to your RAM or coming from it, um, you can use this technique. There are lots of system on chip modules that, that have this just kind of as a feature. You just declare it, turn on a register, and it goes. Um, NIC lines as well. Well, uh, network interface cards only really contain sensitive signals if you send sensitive signals through them. One way to avoid doing this is uh, to not offload your TLS to them. Um, so this is more of a problem in the server world than the desktop world, clearly, but um, if you ensure that all of the data that's going to the device is encrypted and not valuable in the first place, then an attacker who's intercepting your network interface card uh, lines has really no better of a position than an attacker who's been in the middle due on the network. Uh, so that can be a mitigation. Uh, NIC firmware is also an interesting place to be. Um, human interface device lines, well, at this point, uh, the best solution that I could come up with is headless computing. There are device security solutions that exist in the console gaming world of all places that would protect against attacks against these lines, but um, not, not really so much for uh, for PCs. Um, fortunately, in the cloud, uh, there was a trend for a while that started to taper off to simply not have a console at all. Uh, the trend is towards serial consoles. This makes life a little bit easier when you're dealing with human interface devices. Um, TPM lines uh, also are kind of a hard problem. There's no easy answer. Uh, there's two solutions that I like. One of them is Intel's on die TPM, Intel PTT. Um, this helps to take the, uh, the, the ease of exploitability away from the attacker. If the device is no longer a separate device on the board, speaking a simple, uh, a simple wire protocol like SPY, but it's actually on die with the CPU, well, your life is going to be very hard for installing a hardware implant between that and the CPU. Uh, other answers are things like TPMs doing power management and impedance management on their lines to figure out what's electrically going on there. I don't know of any that actually would do this. Um, SPY flush data lines, same thing, make the data not very valuable or authenticate the data some other way, so sign it. Uh, sign your BIOS. Uh, a lot of the same socks that I mentioned that support um, that, that support oblivious RAM techniques also support having a key burned into the actual die to authenticate the BIOS. Um, this can be workable. It makes your updating path harder. And uh, finally, power management ICs. I have absolutely no good answer about that one, but it's fortunately just a side channel attack. Okay. Um, so what I'm hinting at here is that there's a general framework for the exploitability of a hardware implant in a given scenario. Um, it needs to have some kind of command channel. That command channel can be a classical interactive command channel where your thing contacts a CNC and you tell it to do stuff and it does it. Um, it can be a static exploit where you just put a device um, there and it kind of phones home periodically and sends classified or confidential information out of your network. Um, you could also, in theory, make uh, make one of these chips in such a way that you could update the exploit that it's using. So if it's statically exploiting a piece of hardware and that hardware is updated, maybe you have some way to update your chip too. Um, regardless, um, these devices end up going to a device interface or to a vulnerable device, one or the other, and exploit that device. Um, they might report back to you by 
some means they might not actually report back to you at all, although I would submit that this would be extremely rare. And in general, um, you either want to have confirmation of mission success or you want to have the data that you tried to exfiltrate, and so they have to have a way out. When you're looking for these, um, it's good to kind of just keep this in the back of your head and say, well, um, what could an attacker who's here on this position in the board do? What would it look like for them to exfiltrate the data? Um, does this component connect to a line that implements both a device interface so that we can give a device commands, but also a channel that would allow it to talk to the outside world? And should that bridge really exist in the architecture of this device? Um, this sort of thing is always best with examples, and so most of the slides are just pictures. Um, many of them are either ones that I've taken or ones that are in Wikimedia Commons. Uh, thank you very much, Wikipedia. Okay. Um, this is a really old system board. I've used this in, as, as an example before. Um, you, you can see all of the basic components of the system board and uh, probably know what most of them are, um, so I won't spend too much time looking at it. But what I will say is uh, let's just pick a random point to zero in on on this board, because the methodology requires that we basically look at the whole device. It doesn't require that we look at every single component on the whole device, but it does require that we look at the whole device. Um, we'll start with one of the more sensitive areas that I was discussing before, the RAM module. Well, um, this probably isn't oblivious RAM because this computer is extremely old, and so these signals are probably quite valuable. Um, and just look at this for a moment and see if there's anything around it that might be of interest. Um, keeping in mind that in general, if you're trying to get high frequency signals, like uh, things that are on RAM, it's very beneficial for you to be extremely close to the thing um, that is generating or receiving those signals. Um, there's a, a concept of uh, balanced traces, for instance. A balanced trace is two traces that are the exact same length, um, so that uh, two parts of a differentially encoded signal will arrive at the same time, a plus and minus, and op translates that into a one or zero. Uh, this is a technique for reducing interference. Um, if you interfere with this property, uh, the line will stop working and also you won't get any useful data off it. So things like that, the lines tend to be uh, the same length electrically near the point of termination, so there we are. Um, looking at the picture for a moment, well, there's a few devices that we see. Um, when I'm looking for hardware implants, I like to look for devices that uh, have enough pins to actually be a hardware implant, so we can zero in on these. Um, well, what are they? They're, they're little eight terminal devices, um, which is enough. You could potentially have power, you could have ground, um, you could have a data line of some kind and maybe some extra pins for added functionality if you wanted. Who knows, microcontrollers could have about, about five pins potentially and some programmable interface controllers do. So let's look at this. Let's get a clearer picture of what exactly that is. Um, people who are, are electrical engineers in the room are probably chuckling a little bit internally right now um, because this component is simply a resistor. It is extremely important um, when you have a suspect component to look at its data sheet and decide what is this. Is this a passive? What electrical characteristics do we expect from this device? Um, is it a well-known device? Is it something that I can just look up and pull the data sheet for and can I confirm that the thing that I have in my hand or the thing that I have on my board is the thing that's depicted in the data sheet? Um, so this is my starting point for all analysis of any of these implants. If I have anything that is suspected to be an implant, um, start by figuring out what it is. Um, so that one was particularly uninteresting and underhanded. Let's pick maybe a different example. Well, um, here's another place on the same board. Uh, you can see the, uh, the Ethernet port right there, um, the large metal can. I'm sorry, the contrast on that is absolutely terrible. Um, but uh, more or less in the right third of the screen, the giant metal box is, uh, is the back of an Ethernet port. Um, let's look at this device that's immediately beside it. Um, this device you can see very clearly, uh, the part number is visible, um, it's a fairly thick chip, I don't know if the contrast is letting that come through, um, and it's actually right beside the Ethernet port just like we discussed. Um, okay, so when we look at the data sheet for that one, um, we'll see something interesting inside of it. Um, it's just this, it's a transformer. Um, it's a specific kind of transformer. It's actually used to implement the magnetics, it's called, of this Ethernet port. Um, this, this device is made to isolate transient signals um, in, in the Ethernet port from the system board and uh, remove DC bias. And so you might decode the Ethernet signal um, from pins 16, 15, and 1. Um, 
we can actually confirm that that is what that device is. Uh, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of a potted inductor, but essentially what you see uh, inside that device, if you were to x-ray it, is there's two very large coils, uh, or in this case, there's a number of very large coils, uh, and they're kind of just set in epoxy, and this is the entire chip. It should have no dye in it. Uh, it should have no flat piece of silicone on which, uh, that is doped on which there are gates and, and logic functionality. It's just a whole bunch of wires around or around cores put inside of an IC for manufacturing ease. Um, we can actually confirm that this is the case through the use of uh, one of my favorite instruments, the LCR meter. Um, if you find the pinout of this device and attach the LCR meter in, in a strategic place, like on its pins while it's removed from the system board, you can observe, well, are there inductors there? Does it have a whole bunch of parasitic capacitance that it shouldn't have? We'll use my, uh, my ohmmeter too and figure out that it has a fairly constant resistance that uh, at a low DC voltage is not likely to change very much, and then we can confirm, oh, that's an inductor. We can also x-ray it if we have access to an x-ray and confirm, ah, yes, what is inside here is what makes sense to be inside here. Uh, there's no logic, there's no VCC, there's no ground, and so commensurate with that, there's also no, no silicon dye with uh, with logic circuits on it or transistors. Okay, um, so this instrument is extremely good for verifying, this and the multimeter are extremely good for verifying the data sheet. I could use this on the resistor prior. Um, sometimes I have to remove these from the system board because they're a thing that's called a pull down where one is connected to ground and one is connected to a side of the gate uh, to kind of give it a default signal so that it's not floating. Uh, this makes it necessary to often remove things from the system board briefly, um, throw them in some kind of test harness, check what they are and put them back on the board. Uh, ripping your boards apart is a giant pain and so if it's at all possible to test these things in circuits, um, usually that's a fairly good idea to do. Um, let's look at this other system board as well. Um, so the component that has a small white dot on it right about there is a spy flash. Um, this is a really good target for analysis because these guys, uh, you can often clip into them without actually pulling them off the system board. And um, it, it, they, they're the things that contain the firmware that I was talking about earlier when I said there was a possibility that it might be a piece of hardware that's added to your device or a little piece of code that's added to your device. Um, if you're looking for hardware implants, honestly, the first thing that I would recommend doing is find all of these, um, pull them off the board, and see what's on them. Um, if you just inspect the board electrically and just look at all of the components on the board and identify them and don't worry yourself about the software and firmware that implements the functionality on that board, um, a huge amount of stuff is missing. Um, how do we know that this is a spy flash? Well, mostly we know that by the part number. Uh, we can look at it. It says Winbond on the top um, and it has the part number of the IC. Uh, also, it's extremely common for them to look like this exact form factor of SOIC 8 device. Uh, I actually fairly rarely see them look not like this unless they're a BGA device because the board uh, manufacturer is trying to save a lot of space. Um, what else is around this on the board? Um, slightly up to the top left, also a component of interest. Um, that one is a QFN component, so there's no external leads, and it's a little bit difficult to remove from the board. So if it's at all possible to, uh, to determine what it is without removing it from the board, that's, uh, that's generally a good idea. Um, you can do this based on both where it is and, uh, and what it looks like. So you can read the part number, see if that's plausible and what should have been manufactured there, sure. Um, a stronger thing that you can do is you can check to see uh, the lines beside it. Um, you can see faintly there's traces that run to it. Well, uh, many of those traces run to things like a capacitor or a single resistor. Um, this can be hard to do with multi-layer boards, but if, uh, if all of the traces coming from the component are clearly visible, um, it's usually a fairly good bet what it's connecting to. If it doesn't connect to anything sensitive, you can usually just safely leave it alone, and this is how we avoid wasting all of our time ripping our boards apart. Um, Concentrating on the spy flash and not concentrating on the components that are both hard to remove and extremely unlikely to contain anything of use. Um, it, I have some other pictures of this board a little bit later, but um, I want to take a moment to discuss kind of the chain of auditability in manufacturing. Um, so we have kind of these four components, and they kind of all, they all have to agree. Um, a manufactured board that you have in your hand has to agree with the schematic drawing, has to agree with the reference designators. A uh, reference designator is these little white annotations. Uh, you'll notice that the spy flash there is titled U3. Uh, that will correspond to the schematic drawing, but it will also correspond to the bill of manufacturing, which specifies which SOIC should be there. Um, if you find that it's been substituted, this would be cause for suspicion, and you should look at what that is. Probably I would take that chip and x-ray it and figure out if it has two dyes in it instead of just one or whether it looks like the thing that it's supposed to be. Uh, doing that for every board is impractical, so it's really a lot better that we hold our manufacturers not to deviate from the bomb that we supplied them, if at all possible, because then we can verify, hey, is this what it, what it purports to be? Um, but I'll get into a more black box way of, of 
checking how those are working in, in just a little bit here. Um, so I didn't spend a lot of time talking about how these uh, how these hardware implants actually get to your uh, to your device in the first place. Um, there's a few scenarios that that hypothetically happen. Um, one of them is things like swapping out reels in manufacturing. Um, one of them is things like uh, the the evil spies that you don't like literally take your device uh, while it's in transit to you, rip the box open, make some modifications to it, and put it back in the box, which is a technique called interdiction. Um, it's also conceptually possible that somebody might put hardware implants into your device by modifying your code in your source repositories, or changing your drawings, or bribing your manufacturer, or any of these things. Um, so it's important to be cognizant of what your supply chain looks like, and ensure that you have as much control as possible over all of these components. So for example, um, you might see that the, the things that I've already described to this point, much less the things that are more advanced that I'll get into, become extraordinarily hard um, if you don't even have access to the schematic drawing. You're stuck looking at traces and hoping that none of them go through inner layers of the system board. Um, I'm disinclined to trust hardware for which we don't have at least uh, some, if not all, of this data. Um, so let's take a quick look at, at uh, an interdiction scenario. The, the pictures are not from an actual interdiction scenario. The pictures are from somebody who is modding some hardware on their own, which I think is actually fairly similar to interdiction um, because you're modifying a device that you did not manufacture. Um, on the left is uh, the original device before an upgrade. Uh, this is from somebody's instructable for how to add additional RAM onto this uh, onto this daughter board. Um, on the left is a picture of the unmodified device. On the right is a picture of a modified device. Um, I point this out not to say that this is my entire um, thesis of how to look for hardware implants, that if you do this, you will find them all, because you will not. Um, but what is noticeable is in scenarios where somebody has by hand lifted off an IC um, and replaced it with a new one, boards do have uh, a certain degree of, of intrinsic tamper resistance built into them. So I'll look at the indicators that show that this chip has been replaced. Um, it's fairly clear. One of them is. Uh, um, you notice that the solder looks uh, a little bit different from what you would expect it to from an unmodified device. Um, solder has a nice property by uh, via capillary action. It just kind of wets things and goes up a little bit like the layer of water on the side of a glass. Uh, this should generally be how it looks. Um, if pins are a little bit misaligned, um, if there's a bit of a gob somewhere, or if you have a cold joint, as this board does, a cold joint is where it doesn't actually have that wetting effect, uh, you can fairly easily conclude that either this thing never should have escaped QA or it's been modified by hand. Um, it's possible to do better than that, of course, but this is one of the signs that one sees when somebody tries to tamper with ICs, and once it starts to look like this, it's really, really, really difficult, if not completely impossible, to clean it up and make it look right. Um, another thing that we can look at is there's excess heat here. Uh, normally when boards are manufactured um, in, in mass, uh, they'll be manufactured in an oven, so you'll put on some solder paste, uh, maybe a little bit of flux um, and some solder, and you'll put the components on top of that, and you'll actually just bake it, uh, and this causes all of the solder to flow uniformly. The components just nicely slide into place. It's very satisfying to watch if you uh, if you ever have the opportunity. Um, and all of the heat is applied more or less evenly across the entire board, unless your oven is absolutely terrible, at which point a pattern from the oven will be apparent. Uh, what will not be apparent is a giant burn spot on the top of an IC or a giant puddle of flux. That's very unlikely in evidence of, that a human has been with this. Um, Another thing that we can also look at uh, on the bottom here is, uh, is evidence that heat has been placed unevenly and close to the PCB. Uh, remember when I was speaking about an oven, um, the heat just kind of comes to it ambiently. You heat up the whole board at once. Um, this looks more like a soldering iron. You can actually see the dragging of the soldering iron on the board and a little bit of flux here that's burned away and not been cleaned off. Um, it's basically impossible for an automated manufacturing process to cause that in that one specific area and not have the entire board look like that. Um, another way that you can look at whether or not somebody has likely um, been fiddling around with this board with a soldering iron is, um, it, this is a, a board that, that I made for a project, um, and we'll zoom in on a few different points of it, both the top and the bottom. Um, <clears throat> Imagine for a moment that I'm a very sophisticated adversary and I interdict your equipment in my lab, which has a full complement of equipment, including a board heater and an oven. Um, I actually fabricated this board using a process very much like that. Um, so this is, uh, this is an IC, it's a very simple logic chip. And what we did is we took a stencil and we spread some solder paste down on the board on top of the pads and then we put the chip down on top, made sure that it was aligned perfectly with a pair of tweezers. And then after doing that for each component on the board, put it in the oven, baked it. This is the result. Um, you can see it looks a little bit different from the component that was manufactured um, 
via the mass-produced process in the other slide. You can see that it's a little bit rougher. You can see that the solder is a little bit less evenly applied. This is also evidence that a human has done this. You must uh, carefully apply the paste. You must make sure that your stencil is clean. Doing this quickly takes forever. Uh, and so when you take shortcuts, this is you end up with something that looks a little bit like this. <clears throat> Um, it was done in an oven, but it's still full of gobs because my stenciling was uneven. My solder paste wasn't absolutely the best solder paste I could have used. And in addition to this, um, it's not a, an especially high temperature alloy. And so for, for kind of a combination of these reasons, it has a characteristically different appearance from bulk manufactured equipment. Um, another thing too is that you can tell that these components were placed by hand and there was likely a rework here because uh, the, the color of the dyes is ever so slightly different. Um, that could be in, uh, reasonably explain manufacturing variants. It could not be that finding in and of itself is not dispositive. Uh, they're also slightly misaligned, which um, makes one wonder if they were in fact placed by a machine. Uh, one other aspect of the, the device manufacturing process um, is that generally you have a device which uh, pneumatically grabs components, um, moves them via a robot arm to the place where they're supposed to be, drops them, and releases the vacuum. Uh, this device is called a pick and place. Um, it's fairly consistent. It puts the components more or less where they should be on the board. It tends to make errors in X and Y. It generally does not make errors rotationally. Um, these are rotational placement errors, and so kind of uh, one, one scratches one's head. Um, these were all very clearly placed by hand, not with a pick and place. Um, I don't remember if it's actually a rework, unfortunately, but um, introduction is kind of a hard thing to do uh, reliably and without evidence at scale. Um, this, uh, the, the picture on the right is an attempt by somebody to uh, remove a, a BGA device. This is a device like I mentioned before, like the QFN that I showed you was kind of intimidating because it didn't have any leads on the outside. Well, imagine that, except that the bottom of the chip is just a grid of, of, uh, of gold pads, and you put down a whole bunch of balls, set the chip on top of them, and apply heat from the bottom, and uh, there it goes. Well, if you don't have the component there, probably because you're removing the component, you end up with giant balls of solder because it's solder and uh, it, it it's kind of like uh, it's self-adherent. Uh, it, it likes to form little balls. It doesn't like to stay in one place. Um, so. Uh, that's kind of a challenge when you're reworking those, and this is why, kind of, to, to be perfectly honest to you, I tend to pay a little bit less attention to BGA parts because I know that reworking them is an incredibly high bar and you need specialized equipment. To put this thing back on the board, you couldn't actually put it back on the board like this. Um, you would need to actually go through and remove using a whole bunch of heat and probably lead, thereby leaving a whole bunch of evidence of what you've been doing on the board through your heat stains. Uh, remove all of these big gobs of solder. Um, get balls that are appropriate, get a little jig to put those balls in the appropriate place on the board, um, and then put the component down on top of those. This is a giant pain. And so um, in theory, it may be conceptually possible for somebody to construct what is called an interposer device that would solder onto this ball grid array, uh, have some functionality or breakouts, and then have, another, have the legitimate device go on top of that. Um, but you can see that doing this once by hand is hard enough, far alone doing this twice. Um, so what we want to do through this analysis is just kind of raise the bar. Um, I also have on the left uh, a little challenge board from a conference. Um, it's kind of a cute thing because it goes all the way from 0805, which is one of the largest component sizes for little discrete things, resistors and capacitors and LEDs. Um, there's one size above that. It's used less these days. Um, and it goes all the way down to something called 01005. Well, how big is 01005? 01005 is that big. This is somebody's hand. Good luck. Um, so occasionally some prior work uh, that was done a couple of months ago showed um, a, a device in theory that looked about as big as, I think it was either one of these 0805 or 0803 capacitors. These are capacitors. Um, and they figured that what they could do is they could have, uh, have the device uh, intercept, I think, what was going on uh, on the two leads of the capacitor and exfiltrate data by that same channel um, while, while powering it from an inductive coil on the bottom. Um, this device is extremely small. This device would be extremely hard to work with. This device would have to be placed very precisely and very consistently at scale. Um, and need I remind you that this is, this is literally the, the lines on someone's hand. Um, the 01005 form factor components uh, tend to be used more in mobile than in other arenas. Um, using smaller components has a proclivity to increase um, your, your failure rate in manufacturing uh, since these components are much more sensitive to small misplacements. Uh, the equipment that can deal with them is also uh, incrementally
fundamentally more expensive. Um, and so you tend to find larger components on the board. Um, this is a little bit of a risk. You can see that something that's as small as 01005, it would be extremely difficult to, uh, to power it using the, described, uh, the technique that I described with the inductive coil inside. Uh, I believe the, the site where that, uh, that attack is detailed in detail is uh, modchips.org. Um, it, it wouldn't be physically possible in many cases to put a coil in there at all, much less a coil that would be large enough to power a logic device that's actually intercepting and doing things uh, with this discrete component. Um, as well, if you would like to place one of these components on the board um, without it having been accounted for when the board was fabricated, there are no pads for it. Uh, the mechanism that you would have to use to place this component on the board is gently, with a small blade, scrape away the, uh, it's called solder mask, solder resist on the top of the board, that's this green stuff. Um, and you would have to kind of set it down on top of those traces after applying a little bit of flux and solder um, and uh, set it there. It would be kind of obvious what you did because normally there are fairly large pads on the side of this. You can actually see um, perhaps not as clearly in this slide. Um, there's the pin, but there's a lot of space around the pin for the solder to kind of form this, um, that, that wetting effect on it um, and to allow for a little bit of variance in manufacturing. Um, a trace generally is um, maybe half the size of one of these. Uh, you don't have quite as much give. Um, and so that's, that's still a little bit harder. And all of these things add to how difficult it would be to successfully pull off an attack like that, especially without you noticing, hey, why is this component on a trace? and doesn't have any pads beside it. If I ever find a component like that, you can guarantee that I'm going to take it and uh, take my LCR meter to it and put it in an x-ray and figure out what the heck it is. I, I haven't seen one of those yet. Um, Let's look at some other targets on this board for analysis. Um, you can see there's, uh, there's a couple things. There's the component that uh, has a whole bunch of red glue around it uh, on its border, and then there's the component that has a whole ton of leads uh, that says ITE. So let's look at that one first. Um, we can see what its part number is. Uh, we can observe that it's actually a microcontroller. Um, what are we going to do with this device uh, if I wanted to analyze whether there's a firmware implant? Well, um, first look at its data sheet, see if it has any software on it. It does. It's a programmable interface chip. Um, and then usually uh, if, if there's an in-circuit programmer that we can use, uh, ask it to dump its firmware or else um, we can also take it and uh, remove it from the board and dump its firmware and see what's on it. Or we can perform a functional test of it. These are all perfectly good options. Um, the functional test one is particularly interesting and I'll get into it in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to first introduce just kind of this, uh, this hierarchy of difficulty. Um, what I've been getting at to this point in the talk is that adding components and making look-alike components is stunningly difficult and expensive. Um, you have to do certain considerations. You have to insert yourself fairly early in the manufacturing process and compromise a lot of different parts of trust. You have to get this component into the supply chain somehow. Um, other options for these implants are replacing field replaceable units and flashing firmware, and I submit that these things are considerably easier than, um, than the very flashy attack of adding a rogue device to a system board. Um, it's considerably rarer for somebody to to have this type of manufacturing control and supply chain control over field replaceable units, which are often procured at lowest cost and often swapped by field technicians in the field with things you don't even know what they are. Um, and it's also fairly uh, easy, or much easier at least, to flash firmware than it is to be soldering all over a board, especially if your goal is not to leave evidence. Um, <clears throat> So this is a very deeply simplified supply chain. Why is adding components to a board so hard? Well, um, the board originates with the drawing. Uh, the drawing specifies where all the pads are and where all of the traces go and what things go on them. Uh, the exact things that go on it are identified in the bill of manufacturing. Uh, and so if you want to add a component to a board, you have to make space for it on the board in the drawing, and then you have to put the component in the bill of manufacturing or somewhere so that it actually ends up on the board in the first place. Um, there are exceptions to this, but you know, in general, if you find an exception to this, it's because you've put in some extra effort to work around something. Uh, the drawing goes to the board house, the board makes the board, the board goes to the assembly house, um, the component suppliers get the bomb and also send the things that go on the board to the assembly house, and the assembly house puts them together. Um, <coughs> check that assembly house. Uh, they may swap reels. Um, there are a lot of people on the internet who say yes for sure absolutely if you manufacture something in China and you're not having someone on the factory floor watching they'll just swap reels with cheaper components. Uh, maybe you know your your 2% resistors will turn into 5% resistors. Um, who knows? It sucks. So uh, keep tight control over the assembly part of the process that is probably the most sensitive of all of this because it has access to all of the things except the drawing. Um, 
And then at the end, the board goes to acceptance testing. Okay, um, so the thing that I'd like to discuss uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the analysis of these devices um, is there was a paper published recently called A General Framework for Hardware Trojan Detection in Digital Circuits by Statistical Learning Algorithms. Uh, you, you put machine learning into these things so that they sound cool. Really, um, the thing that was the most cool about this paper for me was that they came up with a mechanism to just kind of use physics to check what's inside a component without actually disassembling it or opening it up or what have you. Um, so check out this paper. Um, um, this paper says that making lookalikes are fairly hard because we can detect the excess functionality in devices by physics. We can use x-rays. Um, fabricating ASICs is really expensive, which makes lookalikes hard, but to make them such that they're electrically the same as the original component, I submit is actually impossible. Why? Well, two things. Uh, the diagram on the left is lifted from the paper that I cited. Um, the, the Trojan gate concept is very similar to the A3 analog malicious hardware Trojans concept that I introduced earlier. Um, and A2, sorry. Um, and what the Trojan gate is, is it's kind of like an added gate um, on top of the existing functionality of the board. Well, there's two things that happen with this gate. If the gate is in series, it has an increased propagation delay, and so you can see that the logic signal takes longer to pass from one side of the circuit to the other. Um, if uh, at a given voltage. Um, if it's in parallel, um, in addition to in, if it's in series, either of those cases, you could de detect that there's an increased current draw because this gate is on the component and it needs to have power. Things need to be biased, amplifiers need to run, it's going to draw a little bit of extra current. And so even if it's not visible, um, like for example, it would have been very intimidating to search through that entire die on the A2 paper and the academics who wrote it said as much. Um, looking at it electrically would be characteristically easier, especially if it's a, a fairly large modification to a fairly small component. Um, on the right are the formulas for, uh, for resonance at a frequency. Um, basically what I'm trying to say with those is that there are physical properties that depend on the exact capacitance and inductance of a circuit at a frequency. Um, if you put a tone through it or a signal at a frequency through this circuit, you can actually measure um, how, much, uh, how much reflection happens, how much reactive power is there versus how much resistive power is there. Um, and you can use this to check, um, does uh, the circuit have some kind of inductor added in parallel or series to it, or uh, is it the same thing that I expected? And this is one mechanism for uh, analyzing uh, production variance, which is what the, uh, the, the paper aforementioned does. It analyzes production variance to figure out whether parts are counterfeit. And a counterfeit part and an implant part, not all really all that different to me. So, um, by implication, additional components, um, yeah, um, lookalikes being just additions in a package, sorry, um, it, what I'm trying to say with this is um, if you're adding things to a package, um, like adding an additional die to something uh, or adding uh, on top of an inductor, uh, it's probably a little bit less expensive than fabbing the ASIC from scratch. It's much easier to detect it visually, though. It's subject to the same electronic test methods, and it's very hard to place. Um, so look like components um, correctly occupy a, a deep position down the hierarchy of things that, that are hard to accomplish, um, more or less because of the bottom three points in the slide. Um, field replaceable units are, are easier. Uh, I actually already went over this. The additional thing is that they're very easy to swap in and out. You don't need a workstation with a whole bunch of solder all over it. Um, you can just pull it out of its slot where it belongs, put a new one in place, no one any the wiser. So verify that, that your field replaceable units are what you expect them to be and, uh, and look at those two. Don't just look at the system board. But firmware is by far the easiest thing on the hierarchy. Um, why? Well, you can pick a, a component. Um, try to pick a component that isn't a hard real-time operating system that's a real-time operating system that has considerations where the timing needs to be exact. Uh, if you have a little bit of slop in the timing, you could add instructions. If you don't, then it'll be amenable to the same type of analysis of propagation delay that I discussed earlier that would apply to, to just ICs and ASICs. Um, Make sure that that component has a path out for data. Make sure that that component has enough firmware space for additions. I know there's a cheap Chinese microcontroller out there that has something like 64 bytes of instruction capacity. That's not enough, it won't help. Um, preferably so that it does some kind of self-update such that you can write code that causes it to lie about its own update. And uh, write a firmware that adds the functionality that you want. This is probably both the, the cheapest and one of the hardest to detect firmware implants that we can possibly get because this is your firmware interdiction kit. You need a power supply to enable in-circuit programming because your logic program can't usually drive the whole thing itself, and, um, and, and you've got a, a little clip for a soy gate and some components that, that uh, actually implement the software to flash the device. Way easier. 
Um, I've been talking a lot about scale, but I didn't really discuss why, so I want to take a moment to do that. Um, why is it that hardware implants need to scale? Well, um, this is a picture from 2009. It's a shipping container, and in the shipping container are a bunch of servers and the power management and cooling components required for them. A lot of low-cost data centers are built simply by taking many of these containers, stacking them up together, and interconnecting them. Um, servers are often handled now not on the individual server level, but on the shipping container level. So if your goal as an attacker um, somewhere is to, to tailor your access to that exact device that you know will be in the privileged position, you're doomed. Um, because there's that many of them. And, and so in general, um, my, my idea is that the attack has to scale. Um, and, and you can't compromise just one server with a super custom made device. So attacks that involve scraping off traces reliably and putting the component on the board, anything that would increase the, the failure rate in these scenarios would likely be noticeable because that failure rate changes from, oh, we better send out hands and eyes to repair this thing to a property that we analyze and, and we watch. You know, how often do we have failures on things that come from this fab versus that fab? Um, and, and so um, the scale properties of this introduce additional considerations for somebody who wants to build hardware implants. Um, as well, uh, targeting things to a specific location is extremely difficult in public cloud environments. I have two excerpts from AWS cloud documentation. Um, your US East 1A may not be the same as somebody else's US East 1A. It may be in a completely different data center. Um, dedicated instances exist in most public clouds. AWS calls them dedicated instances. I don't know what most other manufacturers are calling these, but um, there are EC2 instances that, that run in a VPC, and uh, you can actually just check a box, and it will cause everybody else's workloads to be kicked off there, and you know that they're only workloads from your organization. Um, so uh, I'm going to get my implants on the same hypervisor as this person's workload and snoop on it with a power analysis attack. It's really, really, really hard if they know how to use their public cloud correctly. Um, Instances, of course, in any public cloud can be migrated wherever for any reason at any time. So even if you did find the right one and beacon home and do your thing, um, it, that might not be the same in an hour. Um, I'd like to end, since I've only got about five minutes left, by discussing something. Um, I'm, I'm not an unnecessarily hostile person, so I'll tell you that behind that QR code is a leaked document. Um, it's hosted on the EFF website. If you wish to scan it, please feel free. Um, the document is titled, Stealthy Techniques Can Crack Some of SIGINT's Hardest Targets. Um, it's kind of a little puff piece that was written about um, somebody to disclose that their, their particular tailored access operation was, uh, was well done and interesting. Um, they interdicted a Cisco switch that was bound for a foreign telco and added an implant. Um, if you're looking at the, at the document now or later, um, I'd, I'd point your attention to a few very interesting things that I saw. Um, on their workbench, you'll notice that there are lots of blue rollover cables and not a lot of soldering irons. Uh, the blue rollover cables, if you haven't worked with a lot of Cisco equipment uh, as of about five years ago until they started switching to, to onboard serial devices, um, these are cables, uh, kind of a specialized Ethernet cable looking thing. On the one side is uh, RJ45 jack, on the other side is, um, is a serial cable, and you used to use these to configure Cisco switches all the time. Um, I don't know their process exactly. I don't know if they selectively took a photo. It's not necessarily the case that the photo even represents the process that they said it represents, so I make no particular warnings to this. But I just thought that it was very interesting that the interdiction operation that implanted a beacon that caused the switch to phone home to probably Fort Meade and, and tell them all about what was happening at that telco, um, it didn't seem to have a lot of the type of equipment that I have in my lab for disassembling these boards. Um, not a lot of blades, not a lot of soldering irons, no ovens, no board heaters, no solder. Um, and on and on and on I go. Um, just a whole bunch of power supplies and a bunch of cables and a laptop. Um, I thought that it was particularly interesting um, because it, it shows that um, essentially if you can do it in firmware, why don't you do it in firmware? Um, it also shows you maybe don't take pictures of your interdiction operation. <laughs> So I'd like to leave you with uh, yet another citation to a talk that was given um, by, by one of my, um, my colleagues in Seattle, uh, Matt King uh, and, and Paul McMillan um, out of the Bay Area. Um, they gave this talk at Besides Portland. It was recorded, Securing Bare Metal Hardware at Scale. And what they do is uh, they essentially developed a hardware device that goes in and um, goes into firmware um, when a device changes between two different customers and reflashes all of the ICs on this device. Um, 
It's, it's a very interesting device if, if the threat that you're worried about is people making modifications to, uh, to your device firmware because it basically says, all right, for each flash on this device, uh, let's just connect directly to it, um, put on there what we think should be on there, and then all of the attacker persistence that you were worried about in your flash just kind of goes away. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. No, I don't have time for questions. That's so sad. Okay, bye.